Hi, I'm John Belasco, publisher and manager, and you're watching FaceTime with Todd Wooden. So we all heard the phrase, it's a man's world, but is it? Why don't we start off on the right foot here? I will tolerate no irreverent remarks as such. You come from a place where you believe it's a man's world, and I'm here to tell you, you've been misinformed. See, I'm bankrolling this operation of ours now, which means you need me. So rule number one is we will have incomparable respect for the female gender from this moment forward. Listen, baby, you're in my world now. So if you want to stay in my world, you better get your ass in the kitchen where you belong and make me breakfast. He's a dead man. It's a man's world, but it don't mean nothing without that prenup. We'll be right back with John Velasco. We'll be back to the show, everyone. So my guest tonight is one of the top music publishers in the world. He's worked with, you know, some acts like Marvin Gaye, Tina Turner, ABBA, Black Sabbath, and so much more. And let's take a look at a clip. Ain't no mountain high, ain't no valley low, ain't no river wide. summertime so nothing to complain about oh i love it i love it and uh yeah you're looking good by the way i'm um, sorry i couldn't get to meet you um last week i was in times square when you were there as well oh. um yeah at the um because uh eileen knows me when i set up a meeting i have to show respect to the people that i'm having a meeting with right because how many times do people be like yeah i'll be right back and they don't come back and you're sitting there like what <laughs> so I told Eileen, we'll go to talk another time because we were having a set for L's Up Global because I run New York City's Peace Concert in Times Square. So, uh, yeah, but I'm finally glad to meet you as well. I have a lot to talk about. Uh, first of all, congrats, congrats on acquiring uh, some business partnerships with, uh, with my man Jack O'Halloran. You're doing a family legacy with him, I hear. Is that yeah, right? We're in discussions with it right now. He's a sweet it's a great story, so it's mm -hmm. it's really worth getting deeply into it. So we, we're just uh, chatting about the whole situation, see how we handle it. Mm -hmm. So what intrigued you about the story to make you decide to come on to this project? Well, it's, it's one, it's real, which is always good to start with. And there's mm -hmm. some people around still that were around in that time. I was doing a project a couple of years ago um, about another person in Brooklyn from a very similar background. And the interesting thing is you'd walk the streets and meet the real people that are involved in the story. And yeah. all was really helpful when that, that really adds the, the real, realism to the whole project, really. The, it's actually, yes, it's real. There's the cop that was involved there, so-and-so, so it's... It's, and I think that rubs off on the finished product in the end. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. And let's welcome Wonderama TV, who's on here right now. Welcome, Wonderama. Um, and congratulations to them as well for their four-day shoot in Times Square. I thought that was amazing. It, I mean, um, like a military exercise. How they pulled that off was tremendous. And the rain didn't even hit. The rain held off for them. Yeah, it was beautiful. Out. Now, I'll be honest with you. One of the great things about if you're able to do something at Times Square, um, they have a personal friend of mine, which is Damian Santucci, who is the VP of Times Square Alliance. And when you get to become friends with him, he pretty much will open the door for you and allow you to do a lot of stuff professionally. And I think that's one of the reasons why Wonder Ron was able to pull it off, because their crew was so amazing. I mean, I met them directly. They, all, they welcomed me with open arms. And, uh, it, and that's what business should be, is when people are doing great things, it's about the camaraderie. If, even if you're not working with each other, it's that respect factor. And I always appreciate people like Wonderama. So, guys, thank you yeah. for that. 
And what do you see? The head of the thing, Chuck Armstrong, like carrying things and moving stuff around. He's like one of the guys. And that really, that's what builds it. Oh, yeah. Incredible, incredible. And um, I got to ask you, man, you have a cross between like a, a Brooklyn accent and a European accent. Where are you from originally? <laughs> Very scary. I, I'm from England. So I was hoping I still had the accent. <laughs> You you have it, but I could hear a little bit of the, the fighting going on, because how long have you been in the States now, total? Over 30 years. So, you know, yeah, I you see half at English people that come over here for like six months, and suddenly they've got an American accent. So I tried very hard ever to do that. <laughs> I think I lost. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm born and raised here, so it's like I can hear the different dialects and the accent. I'm like, yo, this guy's got kind of a cool accent, man. He can be rugged when he wants to be, and James Bondy when he needs to be. So it's kind of like a cool deal you got going on. Still spell right. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, um, there's something that's big to my heart. You recently did an amazing event, not just recent, but not too long ago with uh, Soho Johnny, and you guys did an event to pretty much give back. You had over 80 celebrities on this thing. Yeah. Tell me about this, because I'm really intrigued about the event that you guys pulled off. Well, uh, Johnny is a really incredible guy. Virtually everything he does, something has to go to charity. And he came up with the idea of doing it. We've talked about a live show. We, and we, we could have waited forever to do that. Then we thought of a streaming show. And the more people we got in touch with, the more people were keen on it. And the idea mm -hmm. was to make it a really eclectic show where it wasn't rock, it wasn't country, it was everyone, even actors. And it, it was for charities that really, really made a lot of sense. It was a major charity, which was prostate cancer. There was yes. a charity, which was um, anti-bullying. And then there was a little local charity, which was uh, Meals on Wheels for... Uh, older people with COVID, which so it, it spread the whole income very nicely of the evening. And mm -hmm. the great thing is everyone we approached said yes with no hesitation. And, of course. You know, and we shot a lot of it ahead, of course, to make it run smoothly. But then the fun thing was, by, we don't even know how we did it. We were in the top 10 of shows for the year, which was a wonderful reward at the end of the day. <laughs> So it, made, it was nice to tell everyone that they spent their time. I mean, it was a six-hour show in the end. And, yeah. Uh, so everyone had to feel good at the end of the day. Of course they did. You know, it's great, man. I go to a lot of events, and I, I cover a lot of events. And one of the things I never liked, and you probably see it in your career, a lot of people always put in their ticket things that partial, you know, uh, of the gross income are going towards a charity. And 90% of the events, and I'm not exaggerating, the money never, ever sees the charity. The charities are never there. And one day, I'm waiting for a news thing to come out where a corporation used a charity's name to bring in ticket sales and never showed love back to the charity because a lot of people do that. And that frustrates me as somebody who loves giving back like i'm a big person on giving back homeless i'm the guy that will go to panera bread when they close pick up a bunch of sandwiches when they're about to throw out and when i'm on my way home in the subway i'll just hand them out to people right <coughs> um, um, that's why john formed a foundation right whole point that we we don't have to just say it's one cherry every event we do we can give to any different charity. I mean, we're talking about right now a, a, um, a camp for um, blind children in New Jersey. Little thing like that, too. Then we're doing something else f with a uh, wounded warrior situation where they do have dogs they train. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's all, it, the nice thing is choose a charity and we can include it in the foundation. And That's incredible. And you guys do reach out to the charities to at least have a representative there to say some words and stuff like that. And they should be there, because I hate when charities say, yeah, yeah, you can give us money, and then they, they can't make the event. It's like, wait, if you're not going to come to the event and we're busting our butt to get you money, then why are we giving you money? Well, it's like, we found that was, funnily enough, with some of the bigger charities, I won't name them, they, they're thrilled for you to help, and they don't do anything. They don't send an email. They do nothing. And that's right. 
difference is, is that actually during the Wonderama shoot, they had on there this chap with some beautiful dogs. And they told us what they were doing with these dogs. And mm -hmm. what I called Johnny, I said, here's a great charity. He went straight along with it. And so the foundation is now giving to them. So it's nice when you bump into a real situation. From the minute I met these guys, they've been sending me logos to put on the things. They've been giving me all the information I need for the show. And, uh, you know, that's the difference. They really need the money and they need the help so they come along. Yeah, and uh, I agree with you 100%. And I'm not going to name names either, but I definitely came across some big charities where they welcome you with open arms, but the minute you ask them to show up or, you know, or do something, their arms close real quick. But yeah. their hands are always open for the stuff. And you know, it's funny, a lot of these charities have, big names that apparently are their brand ambassadors and they promote them on their site. So when you ask them, listen, if you can't come, could you call blah, blah, blah and have them make an appearance and we'll be good. And then they're always like, well, we don't really talk to him that way, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, then why do you have him on your site? It's like, just because he texted and said, Hey, I love your charity. doesn't mean he's a brand ambassador. <laughs> yeah. Like on the other side of that, a few years ago, um, a major composer I was representing was asked by another big charity, I won't name, to write a theme song for them. So we had it prepared with a full orchestra and everything. As they said, how much? And we said, we absolutely won't charge anything. It's for charity. And they said, no, you don't understand. It's in our budget. We have to spend it. And we were mm -hmm. saying, we don't want it. And in the end, we didn't do the project because they wouldn't let us do it for free. And so oh, wow. they put budgets for this and that, and they spend it which it, it makes no sense. But thank God there's little charities around there that, you know, are grateful and will work every inch of the way with you. Exactly. Now, the, the guests that you have on this game are very eclectic, which I absolutely love. I'm somebody that loves to break barriers and merge things. I mean, you have people like Sharon and Ozzy Osbourne. And then out of nowhere, you got Shanana. Now, what are the chances? <laughs> what are the chances of Shanana? showing up to the same event as Ozzy Osbourne. It's just, how did that even come about? How did you guys create this massive list of people? It's basically people that care. Um, some people cared about one thing. Some people cared about the other. The great thing was whoever we picked up the phone to said yes. I mean, you know, Rick Waitman, I've known for, gosh, 40 years, <laughs> said yes. It was, he made a video in two seconds for us. Um, Susie mm -hmm. Quattro, same thing. They just started working on it. Everyone helped. Some were live, some weren't, but then they gave great messages. I mean, all of them spent a lot of time to, to, for that whole streaming thing. I mean, and then, you know, for the anti bullying, it was Jane Lynch and people like So then you've got actors and actresses. And I think that's why the whole idea if someone tuned into the stream, they may not like this person, but they'll like the next person. And it's like exactly. to like. Within that mixture, there's got to be someone you like or someone you always wanted to see. Exactly. And I love, the, I love the mixture of it because I always have this attitude that once you're an A-lister, you should always be an A-lister, right? You should always be an A-lister, even yeah. if you're from the 70s to the 80s to the 90s to 2000s. And one of the reasons why this show is doing well is my attitude was, well, what if I can get Chris Helmsworth on the same show as a Shanana, right? And it's about giving the millennials the opportunity to really meet a lot of these legends that, because nobody does research anymore, right? Nobody goes online. That's Everybody true. wants to see who's yeah. got a billion followers. Like, listen, me and you online don't have a huge following. However, if we leave this phone and we go outside into New York, between me and you alone, we probably know at least 80 celebrities that'll just come up and say, what's up? And people are going to be like, well, why don't you have this following? I'm like, guys... There's a difference, right? Blue-collar business is what everybody should practice day one, meaning build relationships, yeah. right? 100%. Build. And don't, and when you first meet somebody, you know, don't go up to them and be like, hey, can I get a million dollars? Can I get a Grammy? Can I get an Oscar? Like, I got the best film in the world. All I need is George Clooney to star in it, and we're good to go. It's like, no, no, no. That's not how it works. Build relationships. Build trust. I think the fun thing is you've got to be aware you never know who you're talking to. It might be the most insignificant person looking in the room. 
who's probably one of the most incredible people that you've really ever wanted to meet and you have no clue who they are. I mean, and, and you know, I've sat in the back of parties hearing people talk and, and it's hilarious, the things they're talking about, the things they've done, the things of this, you know, and I'll sit with a few friends and we just laugh. It's hysterical. It's, it's, it's lovely that they're trying to do this where if they just listened and spoke and talked and met, every, met everyone, it, it, they'd really make a lot of friends. It's, it's, it's uh, networking is still the key to it all. And basically it's being friendly to people. And, yeah. You know, that's, and, you know, that's what I tell any artist I'm involved with. You know, it's like, what's your charity? And you've got to be friendly there. You're only going to make it because of the people around you. If you're nice to people, reply to people. That's how you make it. And, that's uh, right. You know, and it's the same thing in L.A. and here in New York City where it's the same game. It's just this talk. It's like what me and you are doing now. It's a conversation. Listen, don't resume drop. Get to know somebody. Ask them about their kids. What do you like to eat? It's like that's how you build relationships, man. And like, maybe it's my old school mentality. Like, it's like, you know, I know me and you after that because we have Eileen, a lot of mutual friends. I know we're going to hook up later and like, I get it. But it's like, it's about building that camaraderie. Unless, you know, I always tell people, unless you and this person never met, have a friend in common where she can vouch for both of you. And now there's a comfortability there because it's like, hey, I trust this person in my life. Of course. But it's, you know, and um, people pick up the phone, stop texting. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Three minutes thank off. You. You do what takes 15 minutes in backwards and forwards text. Thank you. Please preach that, John. Please, please. Listen to this, man. I tell people that all the time. Like, talk on the phone. Use texting when you can't talk. Use emails just to follow up. But when you want to get something done, pick up the phone and have a conversation. Because, you know, when I talk to artists, like A-list artists, I'll have a 20-minute conversation with them. We'll get the budget out, the campaign, the songs they want to do, the whole nine. And then you know what I do? We put us in touch with the manager. They send me the deck. Done. <laughs> It's so easy. A couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine who's an attorney who's not too good on the internet um, said to me, I'm doing something wrong. People are saying I'm shouting at me. And I, he was doing text in capital letters. <laughs> and he had no clue. And I'm saying, you know, <laughs> I, Why do you yell at me? <laughs> stupid. You know, who, whoever invented capital letters is shouting. But I guess, you know, he was never to know. It's a. Uh, the other one is, is I know you had a, a, one of my friends on, you had Randy Edelman on a little while. Oh, what a great guy. What a great guy. He actually found out how to push, push the button. <laughs> yeah, it's, the funny thing is, I got on the phone. I'm, I'm, I'm blasting him out right now. I got on a call with Randy and Eileen. Um, I had to teach him how to use Instagram. Right. And it was so funny because... He was, he's one of those people that's very anal like me, where you want to know everything, and it's frustrating because you feel like you're intellectually dumb, which you're not, because there are things out there that I don't know, but I teach people like they're human beings. Right. And he finally is like, oh, that's it? And I'm like, yeah, he's like, all right, I'm good to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he was thrilled that he, well, thanks to Eileen and you, he managed to do it. It was a whole new step in his life. <laughs> yeah and now now i see him on there more and more and he's like i'm loving this and i did the same thing with jack o'halloran oh, i got on the phone with him and jack is like i hate this crap <laughs> oh yeah i just said uh, no all the years i've been with randy i've been like twisting his arm and thanks to eileen after all these years she's the first person to make him actually do social media which is oh. hysterical <laughs> And you know what's funny? This here is actually easier than Zoom because Zoom, you got to go on the link, you got to put a password, and a lot of times there might be a little situation with the internet. Then if your camera's not working, you got to find out what to put the camera on, and then the mute button, and at the and then at the same time you're like, where the hell's my sledgehammer? Because this te this is about to go down. <laughs> you know, there's a new one from uh, from Norway called Whereby.com, and it's Whereby, okay. You don't. It's like a Zoom. It's free, and once you've logged on, you've got your whereby.com forward slash whatever your name is. And all you do is you just text someone, hit the link now. You don't have to make an appointment. You don't do anything. They hit the link, and they're online, either audio or video, and I think up to 40 people. And I just love that one now because it's so simple to work. Not a problem. I'm writing it down right now. By the way, Jimmy Starr says, hey, gorgeous. So 
<laughs> I don't know if he's talking to me or you, so thank you, Jimmy. Uh, I appreciate you. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> I'm going to give you a big platonic hug because I don't get down like that, man. I'm just letting <laughs> you know. You know, you know. I just did a promo for Nick Taylor, and in the promo, I pretty much said, Nick Taylor, the only man's name that fits comfortably around my Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> oh man, he's not, he said not you, Todd. I'm like, that's messed up. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. So let me ask you something, man. Pretty important question. Music licensing and publishing. It's not like something you wake up in the morning, like, hey, what do you want to do for a living? I want to be a music publisher. Like you never hear a kid say that. So how did you get into this particular field? Because this field is very important when it comes to musicians and artists, because a lot of the stuff, most of them have no idea about. Tell me how you got into that. It's a long story, and I'll try and shorten it. I was in the theater. Quick note, quick note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I was in the theater to begin with. I got very lucky that I was a stage manager, and with a very short time, I was stage managing a major theater in London, the major theater. I got bored because it's like, now what do I do? I don't want to be here the rest of my life. I talked to the PR company and they took me on, uh, Karen's, as a PR exec. And I was looking after, in those days, Peter Sellers, Barbara Streisand, I mean, Jimmy Davis Jr. In the one day I got a phone call from in the States. They said, a songwriter's coming to London. Can you take care of him? And I said, sure. And he said, well, he's a young guy. No one knows him. It was Jimmy Webb. So he and I became friends. He formed a company with his dad, and, and uh, we had Canopy. And in the first year, basically, uh, I became like a superhero because we were having all these hits, and I had no clue what I was doing. It, and luckily, I found, and it still happens to this day, a lot of people I would go to and say, what am I doing here? And they helped me. And I still find that works today. And so I learned, really, that doing publishing is really protecting your writers more than anything and it is the bank of the industry so it's the most mm -hmm. important job whether you're in film tv whatever that's where the money goes and at the end of the day it's really i'm a horrible musician i always wanted i play guitar terribly i play piano with one sure. <laughs> so i live vicariously through the writers there's nothing better than i mean this, you know, I hear a song on the radio, and maybe I was in that session and added a word. No one will ever know except me. <laughs> and it, it's a kick to really do it. But just to sit around watching these people composing, like Randy. I mean, Randy and I have been together all these years, and we have toured Europe together, watching him conduct an orchestra to then doing a, a private performance by himself. And it's just amazing, like I say, to watch talent do it where I wish I could do it. So, so really, I'm living a great life because I'm like looking after these guys and at the same time, I'm enjoying the creative things that happen around it all. And, and it's really, it, it's not, I don't really look on music publishing as the musty old thing that most people think of it. I mean, I, I look on music publishing as it's really, like I say, it's like being a manager looking right. at their money and making sure they get it from wherever in the world it is. And I love it. Now, you got to work with so many great artists, and one of the artists you got to work with something I was so proud that my mother introduced me to him when I was a little baby. You worked with Marvin Gaye. Um, to me, he's one of the greatest writers, greatest singers of all time. Like, I don't know anybody can hit that. He says to me, tell me your experience about working with Marvin Gaye, because I can't even imagine that. No, he was... Uh, really, I mean, uh, you know, he had problems and that's why he moved to England and we had to change from Motown to CBS. And just a really wonderful, regular person. That's the nice thing, again, of being where I am. There, you deal with, it's a regular person, it's a friend. Um, we moved him to Belgium and I, I used to go into his apartment. He used to cook me boiled eggs and salad. That was about all he could make. <laughs> uh, Again, it was the process of, you know, introducing him to people, so to try and get his songs into movies. And then here again, the creative process, and to try and keep people from getting to him as well. Uh, if you, you can understand, everyone wanted to get to Marvin, and he was in a place where he would really, you had to really look after him again and be creative. He'd had a little period where he hadn't been doing that much, but the 
his, his creative talent was just amazing. So it was mm -hmm. watching it all come back and him having fun again, because I don't think he'd been having that much fun and he was really enjoying it. It was the saddest thing when, you know, he died. But, yeah, uh, he was an icon in the music industry. And I'll be honest with you, if they really ever did a real, like, now documentary of him, um, people may think I'm weird about this, but I think Marlon Wayans would be perfect to play because Marlon has the same body structure, the same face. Yeah. And uh, Marlon, if people don't know, is not just a comedic actor. He could be a very serious actor. I think he would be amazing to do a documentary on Marvin Gaye. I think he yeah. would. And his like, whole image was... You know, he was so smart, so you know, he was just incredible looking. The whole He had a look, which was mm -hmm. very tough, too. Yeah. And the voice didn't hurt, either. <laughs> no. <laughs> no it, it was the whole package, wasn't it, really? Uh, of course. I mean, he could have a girl start screaming at him, and she'll just be going off on him, and he'll be like, let's get it on. And she'll be like, oh, damn, what was I arguing with you about? <laughs> yeah. It's like over, over. And then, um, very smooth. I mean, you work with ABBA, you work with Black Sabbath, but then another one, which I'm loving, you work with Tina Turner. Uh, I mean, totally. I was talking with Norwood Fisher, and Norwood brought up Tina, and he's like, I would love to collaborate and do a song with Tina Turner. And I'm sitting here, I'm like, Tina Turner and Fishbone. That would be so much energy on that stage. If anybody can make it happen, I want to be there and cover that, uh, if that can ever happen. Tell me about her. I mean, that's... Uh, again, just a total, total professional. I mean, the interesting thing is how she switched from being Tina into Tina Turner. And it was sometimes annoying, you know, you'd be sitting in a restaurant and she was very close with my wife. They used to have a lot of fun together. And we'd just be having a chat. And then suddenly a waiter or someone would recognize her, and she had to flip the switch and be Tina Turner, um, right. which she did so well. But she was one of the hardest workers. She used to work harder than her dancers, rehearse, 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 and she had to be perfect. And, uh, that, and that's what I love. There was, no, I mean, there was no nasty side of her. Every inch of her was just wonderful to work with. And, you know, cool. the first... Um, English uh, tour she did after we got her back there. She there was a young act I knew, and she let them open, and nobody act, just to give them a chance. Mm -hmm. and acts don't do that, you know. Their their agents, their managers choose the act, and she thought they were good songwriters, and actually nothing ever happened to them. But it was just shows she was just nice enough to say, "Sure, let them try out." And yeah. for a young act, that was an incredible moment, and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, she treated everyone beautifully. And, uh, you know, she had an incredible sense of humor as well. So, Did, did you find it weird that, um, because you're, like I said, you're involved with the licensing, the publishing, the whole that, so it's a lot of naming and everything involved. Did you find it weird that she kept her last name for her whole, whole career because of what she went through at the same time? Or did she embrace the name and use it to make herself more powerful? You know, I... It's really funny. I've never even thought of it, never even discussed it. Isn't that funny? No, I just accepted her. Um, my partner in crime, Mike Stewart at the time, um, mm -hmm. a wonderful music man. Um, you know, th th that's how I met with her. It was like, hey, we could have taken her to England. You've got to take care of her. And it, he was actually, I mean, he did have a lot of problems with her ex-husband right. at the time. And it's, uh, no, I, I don't think she ever thought about it because she was Tina Turner. She was, a, she was established as that name. All it was doing is opening up her talent to let everyone see what it happened. And then, you know, putting her with Heaven 17 brought her to a different audience. I mean, the first tour of uh, Europe she did with Barry Marshall and martial arts today is incredible. Is He was a little, a little um, agent or touring person for it. And it didn't do that well. But right. before they were seeing her, booking her back, and bang, it went. Because it was establishing that Tina was really Tina. And she, oh, oh yeah. Many of you saw her on stage, they all told their friends. And there was nothing to match her. And I said, it's, uh, 
whether she was sick or whatever, she was still exactly right on stage every time. And I'm glad you're saying that. And this is why I ask some of these questions, because people don't realize everybody looks for the celebrity in, in front that you see all the time. That's what people pay attention to. The reason why I succeeded in what I've been doing years is I was taught a long time ago by my mother. She used to grow out of Coca Puffs commercials. And she used to tell me that always keep good relationships with not only the people that you see, but concentrate more on building friends with the people behind because those are the ones that have the greatest stories, know the real stories, know the real people, know the real business. And those are the more that, of the people you want to hear and listen to. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on the show because you have such knowledge and intelligence about you because I've read about you. And I'm like, I can't wait to interview John. I mean, he, he's got all this great stuff going on. And which leads me to, you established a company called, I believe, M MD25 Entertainment, which you're not a CEO of. So tell me about this company and the mission behind it. Well, we started it a few years ago. Um, and it was really a coming together of my partner, um, Pete Casco, and I. He had a very big um, agency post on Moondog. And with no music, they were renting music. So we were just talking one day. I had got a different company. We said, let's join together. And it really, MD25 is Moondog on 25th Street. <laughs> it's as easy as that. And uh, so we started doing it. And the clients that Pete had has still, it's like Pepsi and uh, I mean, major Victoria's Secret. I mean, huge clients, which all need music. So mm. I have writers that that uh, write music and compose music and on the other side uh you know i i, I manage people i manage mostly um just composers and uh you know recently um thank god one of the younger singer songwriters april rose gabrielli i said i was gonna never manage again but i actually manage her and thank god it's it's she's wonderful and it, uh, as writer we've got a sign with bmg and a, a well and uh it's really fun to again watch you know another artist start to really do everything you'd hope she'd do and uh so so really the, the whole thing of md25 was just to do comp composer things placing music and film and sync and joining with the post house so that we could also make movies and tv shows and then wow. now suddenly the um management side which had just been lying there we've now got our management client and i really <laughs> don't want anyone else so that's nice <laughs> that's incredible now speaking of all this day talking about with managing the artists and i have a great uh i have a meeting next week with jason peterson who just acquired yoga works he's one of the top streaming guys out there now when it comes to music now and you've been around the block are you finding it a lot more challenging now uh, to really get artists where they need to be because it's not even about making good albums anymore. It's about dropping a single, and if it makes money within the month, you're in or out, and then the streaming numbers and all that. Are you finding it a lot harder to do your job, or is it getting easier because... I, I really stick clear of that. It, 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 I mean, um, a friend of mine has a record label and uh, was going crazy about signing this girl on TikTok that had like half a million followers, et cetera, et cetera. I was, I was saying, you know, don't do it. It's a gimmick. Just see what happens. He forgot about it. Then he called me and said, look, can you see what that girl's doing? She had like 28. Mm -hmm. And it was like, see, you would have signed it. And I just keep clear of all of that. It, it's like I said, it, really my job is to play songs in movies and play songs with other artists. I, I really love writers. Um, because that's the basis of everything. And, you, and if you can be a writer and a great performer as well, then you've really got everything in a package. But a, a lot of the younger writers are really like creating music with electronics and they get lucky hits and things. But right. really, like I say, I don't even get involved in that. Um, and I, I see a lot of them. And then I see some artists which are incredible which are down there and really working hard at it. There's some mm -hmm. in Toronto, in, in Europe, and, uh, you know, the, the Afropop thing is really happening. So there's a lot of real good music out there. The secret is performance. 
And a lot of these young artists don't perform. They make, like, as you said, they make records, they make TikToks, they do Instagram, they do all this stuff. They don't get to a live audience. Right. Be a, a good artist. You've got to be with a live audience again and again and again, because that's how right. you hone your trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I 100% would agree with you on that. Um, I can understand why you love working with writers, because that's where the creativity starts. I mean, uh, to see a writer come at you one day, and there are people that can write a whole song, a, a, a whole score in one day, and you're just like, where did you come up with that? It's like, eh, you know, I was walking down the street, somebody bumped into a pole, and I wrote the next score to the mask, and yeah. that's how it came out. And uh, what were you, what was, I know you work with Randy a lot. Um, was there a top favorite of yours that you worked on when it came to writing that it was so creative that it tapped into the intellect that you love to work with that you like, that was the one that was my baby of all time. Not a real favorite. Funny enough, I, I remember songs from years ago that have never done anything. And occasionally I'll pop it up and offer it to somebody because I still love particular songs. No, as songwriters, there's there's different levels of writing. And I'm yeah. astonished sometimes at younger writers. I mean, Jimmy is still amazing what he does and what he writes. Randy is. And mm -hmm. it's just fun that we got him to finally do a, a song again. He's not done a song for 25 years, probably, because he's too mm -hmm. busy doing scores. Then again, April, that I was saying, she comes up with reams of songs and some of them are, are, are very deep. Some are very, you know, very happy, but right. really looking to someone's mind and seeing it, it, it's different levels. If you know what I mean, I, I think mm -hmm. songwriter, you've just got to have a great imagination and don't mind telling people what you, think. It, it, it's really, it's expressing everything you feel inside that minute. And maybe it'll change the next minute and you write another song about that. And mm -hmm. so to me, it's really important to, that they delve into themselves. Songwriting isn't just coming up with a quick idea of a song and then doing Moon and June and Spoon and <laughs> you know what I mean, which a lot of it is to me. So it, it, I, that's why I love watching the creative process and asking questions. Exactly, exactly. And uh, you work with uh, James Stewart, right? The uh... He's a stuntman and uh, also the director of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. You worked with him as well. He's also in. Uh, he's also doing a band right now called Following Juliana. Oh, oh, okay, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, he's on here now, so he's just showing some love at the moment. Juliana is. Um, yeah. Yeah, which is great, um, and I agree with you on. Uh, you have to write for the love of it and express because I think one of the reasons why Mary J. Blige became so popular she wrote based on her life and if you really hear her music and read her lyrics you can hear the struggles that she went through and then when she grabbed that mic you could feel it through the voice and uh i think that's one of the reasons why and i'm saying it and i'm a dude but i was a big fan of celine dion because when she would hit those notes you couldn't help but break out a tear or something because there was something in her music still in her music with a Whitney Houston or Celine Dion or Tina Turner that relates to the crowd. Is that like the favorite people that you like to work with artists that know how to relate to the audience? Oh, oh yeah, it, it's, it is. It's, it's the, it's the emotion that does come through again. Mm -hmm. They're having fun on stage. You can't fake having fun on stage. You know, if you're feeling emotional, a sad song, you can't really fake it. It has to really come from the inside. I mean, Go back to Janis Joplin, even. Not the greatest voice in the world, but the expression. I mean, oh. you, you, you were blown away by it, you know? It, and it, it's, uh, you know, Adele. Uh, there's, you know, she, I mean, virtually everything she does is emotion behind it. And, and it does cut through every time it cuts through. Then yeah, Adele's pretty incredible. I love Adele. And, you know, Harry Nielsen was a fun person and you could tell all his songs were just fun and joke and easy. And so uh, you can really tell the person when they come out with those songs. Mm -hmm. oh, I completely, completely agree. Now, are you working on, besides some of the artists you have now, are you working on anything now when it comes to films or TV shows that you have some writing going on right now that we should know about? 
Um, really, the, the the main thing I'm working on, like I say, is April, because we're working on shows, we're p playing a tour with her now, and uh, we've been in touch with UK about doing stuff, she's getting on rotation over there a lot. So, as a, as a person, that's, that's the most important thing that's going. We're doing um, a big charity show at Rumi in New York, um, mm -hmm. in, and again, that's to go to the Fallen Heroes funds and things like that. And uh, we're going to have a huge lineup for that night as well. So that that's one project we're doing. And then we've actually, um, Johnny is uh, presenting Marshall Tucker Band, which is going to be fun at Montauk Lighthouse, four Montauk Lighthouse renewal. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, we've got a lot of projects sitting out there. <laughs> Sounds like it. Sounds like it. I mean, and the question I always have to have about how did COVID affect your business and when it came to it? Did it just shut down? Did you find it's not a positive thing, COVID, but it, did it actually boost your business based on because a lot of it's songwriting, which means that people need time to write. And now they had all the time in the world. How did that affect what you guys were doing? Were you more creative during the process? I think a lot got more creative, but if you think about it, that in any time that something's happened, the world wars, anything, what stays up there is music. People need escapism. And music still keeps going. I mean, some people got even more creative than you imagine. There were still commercials there. People were still doing projects. Uh, a chap I represent, John Fusco, did a move mm -hmm. in Hawaii, and they did a bubble in the middle of it all. So the crew, everyone is involved and they produce this wonderful movie there. Um, and so people were getting things done. As an as artist point of view, I think it was good for young artists because it was a great leveler. It, it, big artists can't perform in front of thousands of people and young mm -hmm. artists perform in front of 10. So it came to the point where everyone's on the level. If you were clever enough and inventive enough, you could be seen. Right. And, and, it, and I think from that point of view, it gave young artists, you know, a whole push to be much more creative and inventive. Get out there. Yeah. And uh, I, I definitely agree with you. I mean, COVID, I think it's been a blessing for some people, not for most, obviously, because it's not a good thing. But I think it was a time for everybody to really find themselves and really be creative and passionate. And if you didn't take care, take advantage of over having the whole year. Because, come on, when we all grew up, what did our father used to say? Oh, I never had enough time in a day. If I knew now what I knew back then, well, I mean, you got the opportunity, guys. And if you didn't take advantage of it, I feel a lot of people in their careers pretty much missed the boat. Because I think it was also a way that everybody, I feel, is they have to restructure what they're doing. You can't do the same type of business you did before COVID. You have to restructure your brand. Um, have you guys done that as well with MT25 Entertainment along with your clients? They had to restructure everything? Doing what we, do, what we were doing. What we have done is picked up a lot of new projects so we can mm -hmm. work on the projects getting ready for the gentle opening and things like that. So from film and TV, we've done stuff. And uh, I'm partners with Rick Waitman on his series, which is mm -hmm. really nice which is fun. It's like a mixture between Monty Python and, and Daryl's place. So it's, uh, and so that was, it's all online. So again, that was something that could happen and have a lot of fun with and projects we've been thinking about, we pulled out and looked at them again and found out ways we could do it and having more time to actually put the project together, find different people, different investors and everything else was, was actually in a way quite good. Instead of rush, 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 you can right. have your time really planning it correctly. And and now, of course, it's the opposite. Everyone's rushing and going crazy to do this show, the next show. Because, again, I mean, God forbid it shuts down again. But, uh, you know, everyone's you know, getting out there while they can. Yep, and I agree with that. I mean, I do, I do agree that they started a little too early to open up everything, um, especially when the numbers were so low. I just think a lot of the cities are like, yeah, let's do it. And I think a lot of politicians did it because voting season's coming up, so they're trying to get the brownie points. But at the same time, it's like, listen, it's like, you know, you're not helping anybody if you open up early. So now that everything's open up, I really hope that they don't reverse it because they're going to cause a major problem in the economy if they go from shutting down to reopen and then re-shutting down. 
people are going to not know what to do because we all know the government takes five months to create a bill to help out the unemployed. <laughs> it doesn't even make sense. It's like, if you guys get a shutdown and you decide to do it that day, then the same day you decide to shut everything down, you send out a COVID bill where these people collect this during that time. You don't wait five months and be like, you know what? We'll throw you guys a lifeline line. You know, we'll give it to you. So I'm hoping that doesn't happen. Fun thing and, um, mm -hmm. fun thing going out again and those same people lining up to go in the clubs, seeing the young bands go out there. It, it's, a, it's wonderful to actually see it all happening again and people actually enjoying themselves. And it, it, it's, it's weird to suddenly see it back. But mm -hmm. those I've been to, it just there's so much joy and happiness and fun to actually be there mixing with people and watching live music again. Yeah, I'm so excited about that. Uh, Elza Global coming up. And I, I'm excited to meet you soon. I think we'll have a great conversation. I think I can talk to you forever, John. I'll be honest with you. <laughs> but, you know, we got a time thing going on. Uh, but first of all, John, thank you so much for taking the time out and being with me tonight on FaceTime with Todd Warden. Um, really appreciate you. Uh, I've learned a lot from you as we're talking, and uh, I'm going to definitely heed your information to a T, and I hope people that are watching as well. And uh, I'm going to send you my info when we get off. Okay, Instagram, Which is great. But again, thank you. And uh, is there anything else you would like to add to some of the people watching to give them a little bit of inspiration right now before we go. It's, it's, it, all I can really say is if you really love the industry and you really want to get into it, it's a job. And it's a job like any other job. If you really want to do it, you can do it. But you've got to work at it day and night. I really mean day and night. And keep plugging away and plugging away at it till you get to where you want to be. And, the, and like I said earlier, is still in this industry if you go to someone to say i don't know what that do i'm doing they'll usually help you if you go in there and say i know everything and i really need your help watch out <laughs> and i agree with you totally and thank you for the words of encouragement i appreciate that john listen have a great night i'm going to talk to you soon and thank you for being on here with me man i appreciate you all right it's been a lot of fun you got it have a great night sir right. take care John, first of all, thank you for being a guest on FaceTime with Todd Warden. I think a lot of people really enjoyed the knowledge that you were throwing out there tonight, especially when it came to publishing, because you knowing the rights, copyrights, and all that stuff is a very important thing to have when you're getting into any industry, and you had a lot of great stuff to say. So guys, I hope everybody enjoyed that interview. Thank you to my live virtual audience for always tuning in to FaceTime with Todd Warden. And stay tuned for next week as we're going to have an all-star lineup for the season finale of season two on FaceTime with Todd Warren. So guys, have a great weekend. Be safe, be healthy, and I look forward to checking you guys out next week. Okay? Have a great night. Take care. Hey guys, so while you're at the gym getting your workout on, you might as well subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's the best cool down in the world. Do you feel dizzy? Make it stop. Do you <laughs> Make feel it stop. Dizzy?